Welcome to the Grim Leftovers Show with Grimnir every Monday night at 7 p.m. Eastern on reallibertymedia.com and rlmradio.xyz. Alrighty, folks, we are back for another episode of Grim Leftovers here on this Monday, November 18th, 2019. This is episode 48, I do believe. Yeah, episode 48, week 47, here in 2019. So, uh, yeah, I got, I got some stories lined up for you. Hopefully they're all good. Hopefully you're going to enjoy those. So uh, let me put the uh, little now thing here in the chat so people know I am online here and going to be talking about stuff, different kind of things. Oh, man, it's such a... <laughs> <laughs> well, every day, every every week when I when I when I'm preparing for this show, and, and I and I, I I take a while to prepare for it, to, you know, whatever ninety minutes or something like that, getting everything set up and organized, and and I'm going through these stories, stuff that I had had lined up for the Freakers Ball Show, but for whatever reason I decided not to do, or just didn't get to on the Freakers Ball. But some of the stuff I decided not to do. Is because Freakers Balls, you know, it's kind of a more uh, lighthearted show, uh, trying to keep things, you know, nice and friendly for a for a for a weekend uh, kickoff type deal. And some of these stories just, I, it's just this is terrible stuff. <laughs> anyway, so I'll bring it to you on a Monday night here uh, when people are already pissed off from having to having to go work on Monday. And already in a bad mood. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so how's everybody doing out there in all the various places you may be tuned in from? Whether that's right here on reallibertymedia.com or on rlmradio.xyz. Maybe, once again, you're on freedomsnetwork.com or realliberty.org. Uh, uh, yeah, we're in, we're in these places, uh, tune in, uh, Shoutcast, uh, Internet Radio, uh, wherever, we're, we're all the place. So come on over to the chat here on reallibertymedia.com and you can jump in here into the chat and talk to all the great folks that are here with us this evening. I'll just tell you about the people I see chatting in here, not all the people in the list, but I do see Java Doctor and Beetle and Rob Works, Mr. Sock Puppet, uh, the Moose Girl, the Mada Mada Moose Girl. Uh, I imagine Kate's around somewhere. I haven't seen her chat for a little bit. We got Duh, and uh, I'm not sure who else is in here. I think uh, Flash and Circle are probably gone to sleep by this point in time. Uh, we go up here a little bit. We got the Cyborg Doodle, that's for sure. Romes, Mr. Romes. Yep, oh man. I, oh, oh, uh, Gooberzilla, Goober. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Anyway, there's a whole bunch of other folks in here, though. Come on over into the chat and uh, say hi and howdy. And, uh, and maybe, you know, if you feel if you feel the need, uh, feel free to comment on any of the stories I do as I do them. And we're going to kick it off right here, right now, from a story all the way back in June of 2018. And I bring this to you because it never really became a story. I mean... It was a story here in on certain places on the interwebs, but you never heard about it on your on your clap organizations. Yes, the corporate lame ass propaganda stayed well away from this topic. And can you can I tell you why? Can I tell you why? Sock puppet uh, cyborg noodle, <laughs> excuse me, is hungry. Yeah. Okay, so here we go. From the free thought project dot com by posted by Matt Agarist. Chilling NCMEC report shows eighty eight percent of missing sex trafficked kids come from the United States foster care. Yeah. That's the system. They're supposed to be protecting children. <laughs> and what are they doing? They're sex trafficking children. Uh, America has a dark secret that no one wants to admit. Talk of this secret will get you labeled as a tinfoil hat-wearing conspiracy theorist. 
Fake news and outlets who report on it will have their organic reach throttled by social media and Google and YouTube and all the others that are part of the system. Despite the overwhelming evidence to the contrary, many in the mainstream media and the government refuse to see this very real epidemic of child sex trafficking within the United States. What's more, according to the government's own data, the vast majority of a portion of these trafficked kids are coming from the country's own foster care system. Foster care system. Children are being needlessly ripped from homes at such an alarming rate that hundreds of parents in one state have gone so far as to create a counter-kidnapping organization to stop it. As the Free Thought Project reported, uh, a parents' rights organization filed a letter in federal court last Tuesday asking a federal judge to strike down Minnesota's current child protection laws for being too expansive and removing children from loving and safe homes without due process. They hate due process, the, the, the governmental types. They really hate due process, and they're doing everything they can, can to eliminate due process in, in as many areas as possible. Families are being abused and, in some cases, destroyed as a result of laws that are inappropriate, said Dwight Mitchell, the lead plaintiff in the case and founder of the Parents Association. This is legalized kidnapping. This legal kidnapping is happening in states across the country, and it's contributing to the very real epidemic of child trafficking. The reality of such practices within the United States foster care system is outright horrifying. In 1984, the United States Congress established the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, the NCMEC, and as part of a Missing Children's Assistant Reauthorization Act of 2013, they received $40 million to study and track missing and trafficked children in the United States. In 2017, the NCMEC assisted law enforcement with over 27,000 cases of missing children, the majority who were considered endangered runaways. According to their most recent report, com, uh, complied, what? compiled, I think that meant, from FBI, not complied from FBI data, compiled from FBI data, check your spelling here, boys, uh, and, <laughs> and their own, uh, one of the nearly 25,000 runaways, uh, of the 20, nearly 25,000 runaways reported to the NCMEC in 2017, one in seven were likely victims of child sex trafficking. Of those, 88% were in the care of social services when they went missing. <sighs> Showing the scope of abuse in 2017 alone, NCMEC's cyber tip line, a national mechanism for the public and electronic system providers to report instances of suspected child sexual exploitation received 10 million reports. Yes, 10 million. According to the NCMEC, most of these tips were related to the following. Apparent child sexual abuse images, online enticement including sextortion, child sex trafficking, and child sexual molestation. Other government organizations have corroborated this horrifying trend in 2013, FBI 70, 70 city nationwide raid, 70 city nationwide raid, 60% of the victims came from foster care or group homes. In 2014, New York authorities estimated that 85% of sex trafficking victims were previously in the child welfare system. In 2012, Connecticut police rescued 88 children from sex trafficking. 86 of that 88 were from the child welfare system. Equally as disturbing as the fact that most sex trafficked kids 
come from within the system is the fact that the FBI discovered in a 2014 nationwide raid that many foster children rescued from sex traffickers, including children as young as 11 years old, were never reported missing by child welfare authorities. Yeah, never reported missing. Last year, the Free Thought Project reported an example of this lack of reporting out of Topeka, Kansas. In a shocking report, the Kansas Department for Children and Families, the DCF, which oversees foster care in the state, were found to have lost 70 children after a high-profile case of three missing sisters garnered the attention of the authorities. This has to stop, plainly simply has to stop. It should be noted that there are certainly instances of abuse of parents who should not have custody of their children. There are also many uh, kind and loving foster parents willing to take them in. However, as the recent case in Minnesota highlights, many times these children are torn from those loving homes and forced into a system rife with abuse and trafficking. One terrifying example of kids being unnecessarily taken from their parents by the state only to be severely harmed in government custody comes out of Arizona. The state kidnapped a five-year-old girl from her mother who had an alleged substance abuse problem and put her directly into the hands of the leader of a child sex ring. Even after the girl's mother recovered from her addiction, the state refused to return her daughter. Even worse, the mother found out that her daughter was being repeatedly sexually abused and no action was taken to remove her daughter from the state's system. Sadly, children all over the United States are taken from caring parents who have admitted to using marijuana, oh, no, not that, or other drugs. While there's no national count on how many parents lose custody of their kids each year due to the devil's lettuce, Keith Strop, founder of the National Organization for Reform, Reform of Marijuana Laws, Normal, told the Daily Chronic that his team gets calls three or four times a week from people who have lost custody of their children because they tested positive at birth or in a situation where parents are feuding over custody. This kidnapping even occurs in regions where marijuana is legal. Even high-level government officials have been ensnared in these foster care abuse scandals. As the Free Thought Project re previously reported, multiple victims came forward and accused Seattle Mayor Ed Murray of sexually abusing them when they were children in Washington's foster care system. That's easy enough to believe. Um, anyway, the records in that case go back to uh, 1984. Explicitly noted Ed Murray should never again be utilized as a, as a certified CSD resource for children. It also showed that a criminal case was brought against Murray but prosecutor by prosecutors, but in spite of multiple accusations, charges were somehow never filed and his records were buried. So if you're uh, one of these uh, power people, a government type, uh, then, then you can get away with molesting all the children you want. And they'll bring them to you. They'll, they'll tear the children away from their, their kind and loving parents and bring them to you so that you can molest them because, well, you're a part of the government. And that's the way it works. How many of you out there listening to this now <laughs> have ever been to the dentist and gotten what's called a root canal so they drill deep down into your tooth and they fill it up with stuff after that they drill it all out it's called a root canal from humans are free 
dot com. And this article goes all the way back to 2014, uh, February of 2014. <laughs> yeah, they do these things, you know. <laughs> I've had a root canal way back in the early 80s. And as far as I know, I'm still alive, but it's possible I'm not. I don't know. That's always out there. Shocking connection. 97% of all terminal cancer patients previously had this dental procedure. Do you have chronic degenerative disease? If so, have you been told it's all in your head? Well, that might not be far from the truth. The root cause of your illness may be in your mouth. There is a common dental procedure that nearly every dentist will tell you is completely safe, despite the fact that scientists have been warning of its dangers for more than 100 years. Every day in the good old U.S. of A., 41,000 of these dental procedures are performed on patients who believe they are safely and permanently fixing their problems. Which dental procedure? The root canal. More than 25 million root canals are performed every single year in this country. Root canal teeth are essentially dead teeth that can become silent incubators for highly toxic anaerobic bacteria that can, under certain conditions, make their way into your bloodstream to cause a number of serious medical conditions, many not appearing until decades later. Most of these toxic teeth feel and look fine for many years, which may, which, which uh, make their role, which may make their role maybe, uh, in the systemic disease even harder to trace back. Sadly, the vast majority of dentists are oblivious to the serious potential health risks they are exposing their patients to, risks that persist for the rest of their patients' lives. The American Dental Association claims root canals have been proven safe. Yeah, but then again, they've also said fluoride is safe. So, eh, <laughs> the American Dental Association, yeah, like they know. But they have no published data or actual research to substantiate their claims. Fortunately, the writer of this article had some early mentors like Dr. Tom Stone and Dr. Douglas Cook who educated him on the issue nearly 20 years ago, were it not for a brilliant pioneering dentist more than a century ago, made a connection between root canal teeth and disease, this underlying cause of disease may have remained hidden to this day. The dentist's name was Weston Price, regarded by many as the greatest dentist of all time. That, that's, that's, quite the, that's quite the title. <laughs> world's greatest dentist. <laughs> All right, most dentists would be doing an enormous service to the public, uh, to the public health, if they familiarize themselves with the work of Dr. Weston Price. Unfortunately, his work continues to be discounted and suppressed by medical and dental professionals alike. Dr. Price was a dentist and a researcher who traveled the world to study teeth, bones, and diets of native populations living without the benefit of modern food. Around the year 1900, Price had been, been treating persistent root canal infections and became suspicious that root canal teeth always remained infected in spite of treatments. Then one day he recommended to a woman uh, wheelchair-bound for six years to have her root canal teeth extracted, even though it appeared to be fine. She agreed. So he extracted her tooth and then implanted it uh, under the skin of a rabbit. The rabbit amazingly developed the same crippling arthritis as the woman and died from the infection ten days later. But the woman, now free of the toxic tooth, immediately recovered from her arthritis and could now walk, even without the assistance of a cane. Price discovered that it's mechanically impossible to sterilize a root canal tooth. He, he, he went on, he then went on, 
to, to show that many chronic degenerative diseases originate from rot-filled teeth, the most frequent being heart and circulatory disease. He actually found 16 different causative bacterial agents for these conditions, but there were also strong correlations between root-filled teeth and diseases of the joints, brain, and nervous system. Dr. Price went on to write two groundbreaking books in 1922 detailing his research into the link between dental pathology and chronic illness. Unfortunately, his work was deliberately buried for 70 years until finally one endodontist, endodontist named George Meaning recognized the importance of Price's work and sought to expose the truth. Now, the article goes on talking more and more about these things here, but uh, I think you're getting the point here. If you've had a root canal, maybe you want to have that tooth yanked. You want to get those those, those teeth pulled out, uh, especially if you're feeling any of the effects uh, that, that were described here in this article or are described here in this article. Uh, if, you, if you've got, like, arthritis or uh, other bone uh, joint Ill, uh, ailments, um, other other chronic diseases, uh, brain fog, uh, a variety of things uh, that can be related to this. And as it said, thousands, tens of thousands of these are done every day, uh, millions a year, uh, right here in the U.S. I don't know how about around the world how many how many are done around the world, but uh, it's something to think about. It's certainly something to consider. If you, if you are having any kind of problems, as they said, I, I mean, it could take decades for these things to pop up. And, and mine were in my twenties when I got it. So, uh, it's still possible. You know, it, who knows? I, I mean, I, I have various pains that, well, most of the time, almost all the time. <laughs> so, um, it's just, it's just something to, you know, bear in mind, uh, think about, understand. And, and, uh, if you have, uh, if you're thinking about getting a root canal, eh, consider otherwise. Think of think of maybe another way of doing it. Um, yeah, yeah. You you are the symptoms. Rome's is if you want to know the symptoms of bad root canals, infected root canals, chronic symptoms from root canals. Just talk to Rome's, and he'll tell you about all the symptoms. <laughs> All right. All right. All right. All right. <laughs> this uh, next article, if, if they had the category, I think they would have included it. But I, I, I don't believe they have this category on the Sputnik website. Um, but the, so they just filed it under military. I would file it under pot, meat, kettle. <laughs> this article was posted on uh uh when 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 was this posted uh, oh the first of November. I hate the way they do their dates over there the first of November, so uh just earlier this month all right u s official claims Russia exploits country's security requirements with the s four hundred Russia exploits country's security requirements by giving them defensive weapons. <laughs> Good thing the U.S. would never do anything like that. Right? <laughs> All right. Assistant Secretary of State for Political Military Affairs, Clark Cooper, suggested on Thursday that Russia and China exploit other country's security requirements calling the U.S. the defense partner of choice. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you got three countries to, to pick from. I suppose that's what they're telling you here, because uh, these are the only three listed. That If you got three countries to pick from to, to help you with your, with your security defenses uh, there in your nation, uh, who do you pick? Russia, China, or the U.S.? Well, you got kind of got to look at which one comes with the most strings attached. And without a doubt, by far and large, if you hook up with the United States, 
you are going to have massive strings attached to uh, that agreement. Not saying that Russia and China won't also uh, attach a bunch of strings, but no, nowhere near what the United States does. So, uh, anyway, uh, Cooper spoke at the Meridian International Center, a Washington-based think tank. Through the targeted marketing of systems like the S-400, Russia seeks to exploit the genuine security requirements of partners to create challenges in our ability, legal and technological, to provide them with the most advanced offensive capabilities. So what he is saying there, let me parse this out a little bit, if I can, in my mind, and share it to you. They want to exploit the genuine security requirements of one of their partners to create challenges in the United States' ability, legal and technologically, to provide them with the most advanced defensive take capabilities. So what they're saying is by Russia, or what he is saying, by Russia providing the most advanced defense capabilities to one of their partner countries, they are challenging the abilities of the United States to do whatever they want within those countries. That's the way I read that. The United States can't just willy-nilly fly over and bomb the crap out of somebody if they, they've been supplied with the Russian S-400 system. <laughs> and to them, that means that Russia is exploiting the country. <laughs> Cooper identified China and Russia as strategic competitors whose efforts have led to the proliferation of arms around the world. He says, we have come a long way since the AK-47 became the ubiquitous symbol of Soviet-backed insurgencies from Southeast Asia to Africa. So they're saying insurgencies against tyrants is bad. And it's bad. And, and, if, and, and if Russia would not have supplied the insurgents with the weapon, the AK-47, to go ahead and perform those insurgencies, those revolutions, to take down their tyrannical dictators... That would all been fine. But no, Russia put their, got their nose into somebody else's business. Something the U.S. would never do. Unless there was an opportunity. Or unless they created an opportunity. It says, going on, today, Russia is working hard to foist variants of its S-400 air defense system around the world. While China, which, is that going to be used, an S-400 going to be used for an insurgency? Yeah, I'm thinking no. Uh, while China is supplying everything from armored personnel carriers to armed drones. Yeah, you wouldn't want these people to be on an equal footing, would you? <laughs> Cooper noted that it's the first time since the Cold War that the United States started to lose global dominance in weapon sales. As many nations look at partner, partnering with America on matters of defense and security, not as an imperative, but as one of several options, the Bureau of Mili Political Military Affairs, got that? Bureau of Political Military Affairs, which Cooper heads as the Assistant Secretary, is the State Department's interface with the Defense Department and oversees security assistance and, and uh, foreign military sales. They, they, are, they are the United States, uh, well, the defense contractors and uh, just the government overall, the FBI, the CIA. I don't know about the FBI so much, but CIA, uh, yeah, the DOD. They're all just so pissed that these people might actually have a chance at fighting back against what against the nasty things the United States wants to do to them. And they're calling that exploitation. Frickin' insanity. <laughs> it is Vinny. <laughs> All right. Okay, this article from more recently than previous one, I think. Um, October. This is from October. On humans, humans are free, 
com. Yeah, they, they give the S four hundreds away to a lot of people uh, because they don't they don't like it when the United States goes in there and and takes over these these territories. So, yeah. All right. Um, here it is. The Green New Deal is the old Agenda Twenty One, aka Agenda Twenty Thirty. This posted on humansarefree.com dot com by. I don't know who it's posted by. There's no name. Okay. Greta Sundberg became the poster child for climate hysteria and fraud by sailing across the Atlantic in a supposedly zero-carbon yacht, the Malaysia 2, which, in fact, was made out of petroleum products from stem to stern. Uh, Malaysia 2 does not have a diesel auxiliary engine as other boats in its class do. It drags turbines through the water and uses solar to recharge batteries. This does not make it green. Malaysia, too, like the rest of the yachts on the Amoka 60 class, is constructed from high-tech carbon fiber uh, composites to make it ultra-light and fast. It is the ultimate placing of the wealthy elite. These boats are made of hydrocarbons, not to mention all the energy it took to make them. The carbon fiber composites are primarily made from propane and petroleum. The boat was pumped out of the ground. Like the current clown car group of the Democratic presidential candidates and Hollywood liberals who fly private jets to climate conferences, Thunberg's fossil fuel support stunt was not not about climate, and not about real sacrifice, and certainly not about science. (laughs) Oh, it, It was about shaming the industrial revolution and capitalism, things which have reduced planetary poverty to historic lows and fueled technologies that have raised the global standard of living to historic highs that more people than ever before share in. It's not about climate. It is about creating a climate of fear, a picture of imminent planetary doom, planetary doom, that can only be forestalled by government's control of every aspect of our lives. From the energy we use, to the food we eat, to the land we use, to our modes of transportation, everything from cows to combustion engines are bad. This is the mantra behind the Green New Deal and Thunberg's trip. And if it sounds familiar, it should. For it is the direct descendant of the mother of all sustainable development plans known as Agenda 21. Agenda 21, as Investor's Business Daily noted in June 7, 2012 editorial, was a fundamental assault on the rights of our founding fathers, which they fought for, the basis of the freedoms and democracy that we enjoy. Yeah, they're all pretty much gone, dead and gone now. It's all for surrendering those rights on the altar of social justice, and planetary salvation. One of those is property rights. Land cannot be treated as an ordinary asset, controlled by individuals and subject to the pressures and inefficiencies of the market, Agenda 21 says. That's a direct quote quote right there out of Agenda 21. Land cannot be treated as an ordinary asset, controlled by individuals and subject to the pressures and inefficiencies of the market. Agenda 21. Direct. Private land ownership is also a principal instrument of accumulation and concentration of wealth and therefore contributes to social injustice. If unchecked, it may become a major obstacle in the planning and implementation of development schemes. 
They should they should have uh, bolded the word schemes there. The planet is in peril, don't you know? And humanity is the plague infecting it. The globalists are hammering out an agenda that will determine not only how many people there will be, not many, but where they will live, how they will live, and what governments will permit them to do in order to save the planet. <laughs> oh, God. Agenda 21 failed in its announced goal to eradicate poverty and save the earth, but it did serve as a justification for world governments to enhance their power at the expense of the freedom of their people. Its successor, Agenda 2030, is no less ambitious in its goals for global governmental control, according to the preamble of the document outlining its agenda. The 17 Sustainable Development Goals and 169 targets, which we are announcing today, demonstrate the scale and ambition of this new universal agenda. They seek to build on the Millennium Development Goals and complete what those did not achieve. They seek to realize the human rights of all and achieve gender equality and <laughs> By, by creating 47 genders, uh, and the empowerment of all women and girls. They are integrated and indivisible and balance the three dimensions of sustainable development, the economic, social, and environmental. Agenda 2030 was the death knell for freedom and independence around the world. It is a blueprint for the world government of the UN by the UN and for the UN, its goals and targets have leave no aspect of human life and activities immune from power grabs by government. The Green New Deal will make it happen here. The Green New Deal. Obama embraced Agenda 2030 when he addressed the Sustainable Development Conference. We suffer no illusions of the challenges, he said, but we understand this is something that we must commit ourselves to. <laughs> Was that a good Obama? Probably not. <laughs> I don't know how to do Obama voice. <laughs> anyway, in doing so, we recognize that our mo most basic bond, our common humanity, compels us to act <laughs> an impoverished child in distant slum or a neighborhood not that far from here is just as equal, just as worthy, and as any of our children, as any of us, as any head of government or leader in this great hall. Yes, that's my best Obama, and it's not good. <laughs> Private land ownership and land use are a prime target. What property can we, we can develop, what energy we can extract, and what horses we can build, or houses, excuse me, uh, we can build are fair game. But private property is a prime tenet of American freedom, something Democrats and globalists seek to eliminate or control. All right, I'm not going to go on with the rest here. Oh, there's the guy's name at the bottom. Daniel John Sobieski. Um, I have more stuff on Agenda 21 uh, and Agenda 2030. I was, I was going to share them with you here tonight, but they're, they're too long and convoluted. I, I'll have to make a, do like a separate individual show for those. Um, there, there's so much to cover. Uh, and not, you know, just a, uh, oh, I have to say, oh, that's right. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I, I have a whole bunch of information. Uh, see, yeah, 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 those root canals are really hitting me. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, I've got I've got a ton of data on both Agenda 21 and Agenda 2030, and 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 what they mean to you and I and everybody else on the planet. Um, and it's not good. Oh, I tell you right now, it's not good. 
Uh, so, uh, but I'll have to do a special show for those. I, I can't, I can't really do them. Uh, I don't want want to do them on uh, either uh, this show or Freakers Ball. So it'll, it'll have to. It would probably be better um, if I was able to uh, uh, maybe have a discussion type show uh, where people were called in, you know, and talking about it because it's a huge topic. Uh, it's just something, you know, whatever. All right. This article from April 2nd of this year on newspunch.com. And this one is kind of like a, duh, like we didn't know that. But the guy admitted it. The guy actually came out and admitted it. So here it is for you. MSNBC reporter quits, admits the network is a CIA propaganda outlet. <laughs> Now, I never heard of the guy, William Arkin. Maybe you have. I don't know. But uh, William Arkin, a long-time and well-known military reporter, has resigned from his job with MSNBC while admitting that the network has become infiltrated by what they're calling deep state operatives. Deep state, shadow government, however you want to phrase it. Them, those that are really running the show, and I'll tell you right now, as if I've told you many, many other times, Trump is not running a goddamn thing. <laughs> he's the clown. He's the sham wow salesman. He ain't running nothing. He ain't, he ain't building no wall on his own. He ain't pulling anybody out of any wars. He ain't giving tax breaks. None of that stuff is Trump. <laughs> Vinny would like to do a show with me. All right. Well, I'll, I'll give you his, I'll, I'll, I'll get the, uh, uh, information I have to you on Agenda 21 and Agenda 2030, and you can study up on it, and then, and then uh, once we're both educated fully on it, we can uh, do a show. And maybe some other folks, too. You know, other people that would like to be involved there. Uh, that, that would be good. All right, anyway, so according to the respected military reporter, MSNBC is now, as if it never was, it ever wasn't, the propaganda arm of the CIA and the FBI, and routinely peddles disinformation to the masses. And, and I, I don't know, do you call MSNBC Hollywood? Aren't they back east somewhere? Uh, I, like CNN is back east, a lot of these places. But you, you group them all in, call them Hollywood, call them the, the, uh, the, the global entertainment cabal, something like that. But why do you think I call them the clap? Corporate lame-ass propaganda. And corporate, CIA, is known as the company. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Anyway, Arkin recently blasted NBC News along with MSNBC News in an email for becoming captive and subservient to the national security state reflexively pro-war in the name of stopping Donald Trump. I, I, there's no connection there, but whatever. And now the prime propaganda instrument of the war machine's promotion of militarism and imperialism. Thanks to the collapse of the Russian collusion hoax, uh, relentlessly pushed by the mainstream media for the last three years, Millions of ordinary Americans are slowly waking up to the fact that the mainstream media does not always tell the truth. <laughs> Wait, do, do they ever tell the truth? <laughs> but the lies did not begin with the concocted theory that Trump was colluding with the Kremlin. The mainstream media has always pushed disinformation on behalf of shady government agencies with the purpose of manipulating society. It's why the mainstream networks were created in the first place. It's the reason they exist. is to spread governmental propaganda. When I say governmental, like I said, I'm not talking about those you think you're voting for, the people whose names you know, that's not the government. They aren't running the show. <laughs> they're, they're, they're pretty much as useless as Wolf Blitzer. Or, what, what's that other guy? Uh, King. It's Larry King. According to William Arkin, 
the spooks in the mainstream media are in stronger position than ever before. Indeed, the nation's security establishment not only has not issued a beat, but has indeed gained dangerous strength and is ever more autonomous and practically impervious to criticism. I'll let you read the rest, should you so desire, but uh, everybody here knows this. Every, I think anybody that would listen to the, to a show like this one knows this already, that that there there is nothing true, nothing true at all coming out of any of these morons. And, uh, yeah, that, that's, that's the basic core of it right there. All right, let's, enough of that. Let's go to something a little more fun. <laughs> a little more. From futurism.com on November 4th. The United States is testing a space propulsion system that does not use fuel. There's a whole lot of garbage orbiting the Earth. There are so many satellites still functioning and derelict alike that it could soon become too difficult to safely navigate through the minefield. Now, military scientists think they have found a practical way to declutter by equipping new satellites with, within the tethers, with the thin tethers, that can pick up on electromagnetic fields. Scientific American reports that engineers can steer them back down to Earth when the time comes, without using any fuel. Though it hasn't been tested yet, the concept could make cleaning up space a much simpler, uh, much simpler than other ideas out there, which range from giant nets, like a fish net, or a harpoon gun, so like they're hunting down whales, they think it's the ocean up there, I guess, giant nets and harpoon guns, and tantalizingly, it also suggests a way that regular spaceships could sail through the Earth's magnetic field without using any rocket fuel. Uh, here's, here's the gist. Engineers from the Naval Research Laboratory in D.C. built a small CubeSat that can split in two. The pieces are connected by a strong kilometer-long tether that is not much stronger than a piece of dental floss, according to SCIAM, S-C-I-A-M, -I uh, sort of a, like a space nunchucks. By running electric current through the tether, the satellite can steer itself by capitalizing on interactions between its own electric field and the magnetic field given off by the Earth. That interaction gives the satellite a weak push, meaning that the satellite could be driven back down to Earth while it's time, when it's time to decommission it. Neat idea, guys. In other words, it is the sailing ship of space. University of Padova engineer Enrico Lorenzi, who isn't working on the experiment, told SIAM. So, yeah, it's, it's a nifty concept. I, I, I like it. Uh, it could be... Um, really fun to see something like that go on and um, just yeah, go up there and clear out all, all the trash that's not working get rid of all, all the derelict stuff and uh, just just clear out I mean, you guys throw all this stuff up there in space and just load it, let it float around forever and it, it's like a big garbage heap up there alright alright what's this one Oh, uh, Hal covered this yesterday on his show, but I already had it in my list before Hal covered it, and and I just wanted to touch a little bit on it here with you, because uh, I'm rural, I live rurally, and a lot, I know a lot of you two also live in rural areas, some of you are urbanites, or suburbanites, but for those, that's a, that's a, that's a, those of us out here in the urban areas, I guess we are just dumb, bad people. Horrible folks that make terrible decisions. <laughs> and, and we deserve uncomfortable lives. That, according to a UC Berkeley 
graduate student and instructor, who, what he said on Twitter last Wednesday, to vent his repulsion for us rural Americans and why we deserve to live terrible, horrible, uncomfortable lives unless we get with the program and move into the big city and be like him, be a douchebag, hipster, like him. <laughs> Jack Curdian, graduate student who has taught at least 11 philosophy courses at the university, posted the unironically embrace the bashing of r rural rural Americans. That's a tough word to say, isn't it? Rural? Rural? <laughs> All right. They, as a group, so I'm part of a group now. I can't just move out and be who I am. I'm part of a group known as Rural Americans. They, as a group, are bad people who have made bad decisions in life. <laughs> you hearing this, Christine? All right. <laughs> You're a bad person. This guy said so, and he's from Berkeley. <laughs> he said in his since-deleted tweet, some, I assume, are good people, but this nostalgia for some imagined pastoral way of life is stupid, and we should shame people who aren't pro-city. Well, let me tell you why I'm here rather than in the city. is because people like you, you suck, and I don't want to be anywhere near you. People in general. <laughs> I, I just, I don't get it. I have no, why would you want to be all packed in like that? It's disgusting. Anyway, according to Campus Reform, the Twitter thread started with Kearney in advocating against affordable health care solutions for rural Americans, saying that rural health care should be expensive. How can, how can it be more expensive than, than what your boy Obama created? I don't know. And the expense should be borne by those who choose rural America. I am bad. I'm horrible. Wait, you're living in Arkansas. That's kind of rural by itself. All of Arkansas is rural. Let me say right now, even if you're in a city in Arkansas, you're rural. <laughs> All right. He, he goes on to say, uh, the same goes for rural broadband. Well, let me tell you right now, rural broadband is expensive. And gas taxes. Well, you're paying tax on, on, on the gasoline, and you got to drive further uh, if you want to go into a city. So you are paying more in gas taxes. He argued it should be uncomfortable to live in rural America. As bad as it is in the city? This guy needs his head examined. Let's just be nice and say examined. <laughs> It should be uncomfortable not to not move. They want So they want people that live out here where I do to move into the city so that we can be robbed and <laughs> harassed. And <laughs> uh, I have two words for you, buddy. They start with the letters F and Y. You got it? You got it? <laughs> Oh, man. All right. Oh, I should have kind of covered this when I was talking about the space propulsion system. Doesn't matter, though. This was not actually found in space. It was found here on this planet. And, yeah, 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 you're still rural. Arkansas. You're Arkansas. <laughs> All right. From New Earth dot Media. Huh. I wonder if, huh, I'll have to think about that. RealLiberty.media. Hmm, that could, that could be a thing. All right. Uh, not that I need another domain for any, uh, by any stretch of the imagination. <laughs> but RealLiberty.media, that sounds pretty good. All right. Anyway, so here we are, New Earth. Marijuana in space. NASA discovers CHC on meteorite fragment. Yep, space weed, baby. <laughs> Scientists recently found tetrahydrocannabinol, THC, on a meteorite in space. 
The amounts found were small traces, but the fact that it was able to survive there for extended periods of time is very interesting. F and Y, yeah. Fuck and you. <laughs> Where did it come from? Could it be that some of the conditions exist in space to produce the complex molecule without an organic process? Think, uh, given, I think given the fact that THC is one of the more complex biochemical compounds known to man, it seems unlikely. What's interesting is that THC and cannabinoids in general uh, seem to be ready-made, a ready-made batch of compounds for the human body. The endocannabinoid system is the biological messaging apparatus that facilitates the body in healing and overall maintenance, which cannabinoids naturally work with. Yeah. All right. So what is the chemical that, that seems to be perfectly made for human biology uh, doing in space? That's the big question. A team of astrophysicists in the University uh, of Hawaii have created a somewhat of a stir within the scientific community after the, the discovery of trace amounts of THC on a meteorite found in Nevada, the Nevada desert in 2010. The team of researchers who analyzed hundreds of meteorite fragments in search of uh, microbacterial data found the presence of THC in trace amounts in principal psychoactive, the principal psychoactive constituent of cannabinoids, a class of diverse chemical compounds that are found in a variety of plants, but mostly, fa but most famously, in the cannabis plant. You gotta wonder. You gotta think. If THC is just floating around out there in space, maybe THC is responsible for seeding life on planets, for causing a planet to go from a barren rock to a life giving planet. THC could be the key to life in the universe. <laughs> the study that is funded in part by a NASA grant for research in astrobiology is the first documented find of a psychoactive organic compound originating from outside the Earth's atmosphere, a discovery that could revolutionize our modern view of psychotropic agents and their cosmic origins. Cosmic, dude. Uh, so he admits, or that was admitted by astrophysicist James Hahn, head of the research team. The discovery was clearly unexpected, admits the astrophysicist specialized in astrobiology. These findings will have a profound impact on the science of astrobiology as a whole. If psychoactive elements are found outside of the planet's atmosphere, what does it say about the rest of the universe? If these chemical substances that change brain functions and result in alterations in perception, mood, or consciousness in mammals, as well as humans, uh, well, since we're mammals, I don't really need the as well as there, um, find their origin in outer space, what role then has uh, cometary impacts, what role then has cometary impacts played on the human species? or on life on the planets as a whole. This discovery ultimately leaves us with more questions than answers, acknowledges the professor. It also gives a whole new mean, meaning to the term getting high. <laughs> All right, there's more there as well, should you so desire. Let me wrap it up with this, because... The season is coming up quickly. The season is coming up upon us. And maybe some of you have male people you need to, uh, or you would like to purchase, purchase presents for. You know, whether that be fathers or sons, 
uh, just friends, brothers, whatever. You know, you know, you know um, that there's that, the, that there's males in your life uh, that that you might want to uh, purchase a gift for for Christmas. And this could not be any better. It's called the testacuzzi. <laughs> yes, it's a jacuzzi for for his nuts. <laughs> it's a little bath thing. You put your nuts down in there. I, I'm guessing I don't know really how it works. <laughs> there is a video, but I have I didn't take the opportunity to watch it. And it's only thirty nine dollars and ninety five cents. The perfect stocking stuffer for this nut jacuzzi. They do also have a limited edition twenty four karat gold plated one that goes for ten thousand dollars. But that's crazy. Ten thousand dollars for gold plate. <laughs> By the way, if you are planning on buying a test jacuzzi for one of your uh, male friends or relatives, uh, brothers, whatever, uh, th then you have to go ahead, if you want it delivered by Christmas, uh, th then you'll have to order by November 29th, because the sales on these have been so great, so great, uh, that, that they will not be able to get it delivered uh, to you prior to Christmas, should you order after November 29th. So, uh, get your little nut Relaxer? <laughs> Test jacuzzis for all. <laughs> all right, folks. That'll wrap it up for me here today on the Graham Leftover Show. Thank you all so much for tuning in. I had a great time. Hopefully you all did too. I'll be back next Monday with more. Uh, t tomorrow is uh, In a Perfect World with Slash and Vin E. Right here on RLM Radio, 1 p.m. Eastern. Check the schedule on RealLibertyMedia.com for all the rest of the shows that come up throughout the week. Talk to you later. Peace.